As always, I'm your host, J. Michael Silver, and this is Foundational Steps to Show, where I talk with people about the choices they make to get where they are in life. I've got another great episode for you. I'm talking with Anthony Morrison, founder of The Londoner, a full-service salon in Los Angeles. You might recognize Anthony from the TV network Bravo, either winning shows or giving advice for hairstyles. Anthony is so much more than that. He is a true inspiration for what one can do in their life when they set their mind to it. Links for Anthony and timestamps for everything that came up while we talked are below. Please leave a comment or review. I'd love to hear your thoughts and check out our affiliate links for cool things you may find of value. Enjoy our conversation. Anthony, welcome. Uh, excited to have you here. Um, Happy to be here. So I, do, just to start off, give, give me a, a quick like synopsis, like a, a blink of like who you are, where you're at in your life right now. Like how, how would you uh, quickly define yourself? Um, I would say my life is ever evolving and it has been for many years now. Oh, that's exciting. And where I'm at in my life right now is a place of gratitude and wanting to help people. And I've always that's been cool. that way, but um, just of late, it's been even more, more ramped up. I really feel that there's a call in to do something really quite special um, in this world. You know, we only have, we're only here, I always say, we're only here but for a moment, it's for just a, a blink of an eye blink, we're on this yeah. earth. And, you know, what's your legacy? What will people, you know, be reminded of when you're no longer here? How have you impacted? How have you helped? How have you changed the course of somebody's life along the way of your journey? Yeah. And um, I, mean, I have sometimes a special... You... I was just gonna say, sometimes you can't even know, uh, and, and or sometimes you find out later how you impacted someone, and it's just kind of an amazing thing, you know. Exactly. So just to just to live that way and to put yourself out like that, you may be touching untold number of lives, and some of which you may never find out, just because you know you carry that gratitude and that grace. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's a beautiful um, thing. Yeah, my my profession allows me to lend to that as well because what I do in my salon is I bring people in especially from beauty school as mm -hmm. new you know people into the industry and I train them I put them on my training program for a year and then I teach them everything that I know I give it away freely because when you give it away it comes back to you tenfold and you give it away in hopes that they will learn something to also share. Absolutely. So, so, yeah. Do you think of it as as a, like an apprenticeship? It is an apprenticeship. Okay. Yeah. I, it is an apprenticeship. I love I, the whole concept of apprenticeship. I mean, I remember when I was a little kid, uh, you know, we would do, we'd be in history class or whatever, and we'd learn about, you know, apprenticing black for blacksmiths or Thatchers or, you know, yeah. whatever. And I always thought that made so much sense. And I never really understood why we were in school and what the point of it was. Um, right. You know, there were some good things, some bad things. And, um, you know, Western education in general, I feel like is very similar, you know, whether it's the UK or America or, or Germany or wherever. Um, but there's, there's something special in my mind, you know, where you get hands-on experience and you get to see experts, masters do what they do and then try things and learn things. It's, it's a, it's a whole mind expanding experience, I think. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, um, I also feel, you know, you know, speaking of that, um, with the apprenticeship, I knew that I wanted to be a hairstylist at eight years old. So that's amazing. My, my path was already set for me as a very young, young little boy. Okay, well, let me use that as kind of a springboard. Um, so lately, when I when I talk to people, I, I use and I and we talked about this a little bit beforehand. Um, there's one kind of primary question I like to get at is when you know what moment in your life did you realize you were conscious or, or that you could make a choice that affected your reality and so you just said that you've known you wanted to do this uh since you were eight years old so yeah. 
like, what was that moment? Like, I mean, I'm assuming that's probably the moment for you that you became kind of conscious in your body, like you were living this life. Like, what was that? And, and was that the first moment? Or was there something earlier where you were like, you know, oh, I'm doing this thing. This is <laughs> game on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living life. Mm -hmm. It was earlier. It was way earlier. And oh, wow. um, yeah, my, my relatives will tell you that even as a little baby, when they would pick me up, the first thing I would do is grab hold of people's hair. And I would just like go for it every time. And, you know, growing up as a little kid, I would, you know, I have 13 uncles and aunts on my mother's side, eight on my father's side, you know, That's lots huge. of lots of cousins that are all, yeah. you know, girls and women, lots of aunts. And so I was most happiest when I was watching my other aunts and my sisters do each other's hair. That's where I was the most happiest. Not playing outside, playing football with my mates or or doing any of that stuff. It was it was basically fixated on hair. I loved the color of it, the texture of it. I was just yeah. Was there any lucky. one specific moment like when you were I don't know, 2, 3, 4 years older or or you know, earlier than 8 obviously that, that you said uh, was there one specific moment that you touched hair that you could like you could feel the fibers? I mean, what like what was the moment or what yeah. was the or was there just one or was it just several? I, yeah, I guess there was like lots of moments. Yeah. You know, um, if my mind goes back, I think it was around when I was six or seven okay. in the grocery store. Yeah that I would go off and I would be where the shampoos were, where the relaxers were. Back in the days, it was Jerry Curls, for, you know, right. black hair. So I would be where the Jerry Curls section was, looking at all the boxes, looking at the, the nice hair that was glistening on the boxes and all that. And I actually have a picture um, that one of my cousins took of me with my little with my little wool hat on and my little bomber jacket <laughs> zipped up. And I've got nice. this box of curly Afro sheen thing in my hand, looking at it. And it's the, it's the cutest picture ever. And, and um, I got awesome. that many years ago. They sent that to me and said, we knew you were going to be a hairstylist. Look at this picture. I said, oh my <laughs> God, how did you get that? They're like, yeah, you were, you were so young when we took that. So I don't know. I don't know if there was one moment. I think there was just many moments. That many kind of obsessed thing. moments with hair, touching it, seeing it, looking at it. Did you yeah. now... Were you obsessed? I mean, at a, at, especially at a young age, were you obsessed with your own hair and how your hair looked? Or was it primarily looking and examining and touching and, and kind of experiencing other people's hair? Oh, no, I was obsessed with my own hair, too. I had an, I had an afro for many, many years. And, um, and my dad used to cut my hair, you know, once, once every four or five weeks, he used to trim my hair up for me. And now, was he I a barber or was this his just no, the father cutting his just, son's hair? It, it was just a, a father doing what, you know, a, yeah. a Jamaican, a Jamaican father that grows up in Jamaica, learning to cut hair and doing everything else. That's what they do. Nice. And so uh, and so I wasn't lucky enough to go to a, to a hair salon, <laughs> salon <laughs> early on, like most like most kids these days. Well, I don't know, that's so, a, but it's a special experience, though, getting to have that, you know, that that time with your dad. I mean, I, I feel like anytime I look back where it's a positive experience with my parents, I cherish that that much more. So, um, you know, I don't know, there's something to be said. There's something to be said that perhaps, you know, taking a, taking a, a six-year-old to a salon maybe is depriving a special bonding moment. I don't know, <laughs> because I know a lot of, a lot of kids get their haircuts by their parents, uh, you know, until a certain age. Um, and so I, I don't know. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> it's just my no, point. And, and I totally get that. And I appreciate that now. Yeah. But at the time. <laughs> oh, fair. Yeah. You know, when enough. I'm showing up at school with the dad cut, you know, and all, <laughs> it's like, oh God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Will this ever go out? And so, and so, but now my dad passed away in 2004. I look back at all of those moments, absolutely. And just oh, treasure every single, every single special moment that we, we, we ever had. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, and then going to my first hair salon, barbershop to get my hair cut, that was another experience as well, getting this really professional, great cut that was just, you know, everything that I'd asked them to do, they did, and it was just oh, wow. really great. So, um, so that kind of was also part of the journey after that, then it was like, 
oh, my hair actually kind of looked really good. Okay, so here we go. So, you know, um, but yeah. How old were you when you got your first like professional cut where you just looked and said, oh yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is working? <laughs> well, when I was, I left school when I was 15 okay. and, um, and went straight into a five-year apprenticeship in London. And then after that apprenticeship was over, I started working at an, a really amazing salon in central London. But I was probably about 13 at the time when I had my first haircut, nice. my first professional haircut. And I used to work at a fish and chip shop. So after school, I would go to a fish and chip shop and I would peel potatoes for hours and mm -hmm. save up my money. And once I got enough money, I went and got myself a haircut. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, that's great. So your first experience uh, was was something you worked for then. It wasn't like, uh, it wasn't a special gift. It was, you know, a special uh, moment for you because you had really earned it. Yeah. And, um, you know, my dad, my mother died uh, giving birth to my youngest sister mm. when she was 27. So my dad is an immigrant from Jamaica, came over to England with my mother in the early 60s, got married there, um, had two children. On my third, my mother was giving birth to my sister, third child. And meanwhile, giving birth, she passed away. She had a brain hemorrhage, she passed away. Oh, wow. My dad went to the hospital with two children, came back with three children and no wife. And That's so, heavy. yeah. And so, you know, um, it was, it was, it was, we didn't have the easiest life. Um, you know, he worked hard and struggled with a lot of things, but we knew inherently that he was sacrificing so much for us um, by not putting us in a home or, you know, or absconding his fatherly duties and, yeah. and all of those things. He stuck with us and, yeah, you know, raised us the best way he possibly could, but we didn't have a lot of money. So I worked for everything that I wanted basically and saved. So I never asked my dad for anything. You know, I only got what he gave me and that was probably fine. Everything else I went and knew that I had to work for. So when I was 13, I was like, right, I'm going to go get a job and walk down to the local chippy. Um, I was in for a job. They were like, sure. So I got my first job at 13. <laughs> and you're, you're the oldest? I'm the middle. Oh, you're the middle. So I've got an older sister and uh, a younger sister. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And were were your siblings also, you know, gun ho to get out there and start working and doing their own thing as well? Yeah, both of my sisters are very, very industrious. They're they're um, they're you know, much like myself, and uh, they've been they they are successful. And, yeah. Uh, do and do was your father an entrepreneur, or was that really more kind of you you and your sisters took that on kind of thing yeah my dad was a factory worker okay um came over from jamaica as part of a program that england had with jamaica at the time because jamaica was part of the um you know part of the british british colonies okay and, and um so at, in the 50s 60s they had a partnership with um, a lot of the caribbean islands for people oh. to come over to england and work so that's what my dad did and he got a factory job and um, that's pretty much what he did until uh, until he retired. Oh, wow. OK. And once you I mean, you wanted to do hair at age eight. So, I mean, you know, you've got a job at the first place you could get a job that, you know, the the uh, fish and chips place. Um, what was there? And I know you've had multiple salons. Uh, was there any other, you know, kind of entrepreneurial endeavors, you know, prior to, you know, prior to having your own first shop i mean like you know you went and you worked at the at the at the um at the chippy, <laughs> yeah, chippy, um, chippy. The, yeah uh and then you did your five-year apprentice which i'm assuming there was a some pay there as well and, yeah. and then you went on to um so were there any other entrepreneurial things um prior to opening up your first salon i don't know if they were entrepreneurial with regards to making money mm -hmm. but i've always been you know, and, and, I, and I opened up this conversation by saying that, you know, I've always been in the mindset of wanting to do for others, help, yeah. you know, support. And so it's, it, it's always been that way. So as the, at a very young age, I had a, um, a photography club where we get like my local friends to come around and we would, my dad had one of those cameras that, you know, you pressed it and it opened up like a, 
you know those yeah, um, yeah, yeah. those old fashioned cameras yep. that open. You, you, you know what I mean? I, I, I know what you mean. I, I can't think of what it's called. Um, yeah. yeah, I know what you're kind. It opens up and it has it, like is it the kind you look down here and then the lens comes out here and exactly exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So he had one of those and uh, I started a photography club and then I started a boxing club which didn't last too long because I got hit a couple of times and that was not good. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started a disco club, you know, in my in in our in our shed in the back, you know, I got all the all of us to get together and I play music and we would all dance. And so I've always been into organizing, arranging, getting people together. Um community and, development uh, to some extent. I mean yeah, 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 yeah. And and that's that's where I'm most happiest. That's why I've kind of gravitated towards salon ownership, business ownership, because I, I think I'm good at it. Um, I know what it takes to be successful and um, I have the right mentality for it, you know, because yeah. it's not just about me. Yeah. It's, about, it's about we and, you know, and if you're successful, I'm successful yep. and vice versa. And we it's all win. win. Yeah. So, so that's, that's how I've, managed to own three salons here in the states and one in england as well yeah that's amazing uh you know i was curious because you know because you like you mentioned you started the conversation off with you know kind of a desire to help people um to me you know hair hair stylist hair cutting design and all that stuff there is an element of service there because you're providing a service it's not um it's it's not just like exchange of goods you know kind of thing there's a service there so you know and i also think that when people uh look good they feel good and it changes their entire kind of way they carry themselves so you know i'm assuming you look at that now but was that part of your consciousness as a as a young person or did that come in when you were apprenticing or later that you know just giving people a great haircut, I mean, or style, uh, or anything involved with the whole design coloring and everything else. Um, that's an act of service. That's, you know, helping people making their lives better. Has that always been part of the haircutting or did that kind of come later? No, that's always been, that's always been part of it. Always at the oh, beginning. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the, the, the other part of that is I'm a people person. So I love people. Mm-hmm. And so when I get somebody in my chair, and especially when we build a relationship with each other over a period of months or years, I've mm-hmm. got clients now that I've been doing for 30 years, I've seen their children grow wow. up and get married, That's amazing. you know, and um, the whole thing. So it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's more than that. It's, it is about making people feel good, but it's also connecting with lives, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, you know, I consider most of my clientele, my friends, you know, because um, when they come in, I'm so happy to see them. And it's like, oh, catch me up. You know, we've got an hour. Tell me everything, you know. And um, and I think also it's a way for someone to sit in my chair and talk about themselves because we don't get an opportunity to do that that often, you know. Yeah. You know, so I ask all the questions. I get it all out of them. And it's like, Okay, go into detail, tell me all about that and because I'm, I'm really interested. And I remember, so when they come back next time, I say, so how was, you know, how was the surgery? How was your husband? You know, and, yeah. and it, it, that's, that's what it's all about. And, you know, um, people want to feel that you care yeah. and, you know, you're interested, you care. And it's not just about getting somebody in and giving them a haircut and kicking them out of the door. Yeah, no, I, 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 sorry, yeah. say again. I always say to my staff, um you know it's like going to a restaurant you can go to the best restaurant in all of LA right and you could have the most incredible meal like oh my god it was but the service wasn't up to scratch you know you felt you you felt you weren't welcome there you didn't feel valued as a as a as a customer you didn't feel that you know you know what I mean and so you walk out of there feeling like you got the best food but the service wasn't good. You yeah. won't go back. Whereas you go somewhere where the services, where the food is, you know, good. It was amazing. Right. But you were treated like absolute gold and you felt so good walking out of there. I'm going back. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going back. And um, 
that's what we that's what we try and do here you know my my staff that i i i hire it's all about customer service it's all about making that's fantastic good. yeah I, I mean i i kind of view life as customer service you know to some extent you know being of service i think is probably you know the the point of life to some extent i mean yeah. like you know you could i i, I could I could argue even on the the opposite side of that, but you know, if you really kind of get into it, we are um, we are creatures that I mean, we can't really live on our own or su survive on our own for the first several years. So we're basically it's baked into us from a very early age that we need at least one or more people to survive, and the more people we have to survive, the better off we are. And you know, you're only as good um to the community as you are in you know in your best self so the better you are at being your best self the better you can give to the community or you know to to your you know group and that's kind of it that's kind of everything you know after that like you know I, I mean, it can get a little bit gray at times, but I think you, I think we really need to all distill it back down to what am I doing for my community? And, and your community will make you a better person by virtue of saying, this is what I really want to do and what I really want to give. And I'm trying to do this the best way I can, you know, and your community will, you know, lift you up and then you'll in turn lift them up even, even more. That's kind of my my thinking. No, and I I, I completely agree with that. You know, um, you know when you really look at what we're here to do and who we're here to serve, you know that's that. I think what you just said is so integral. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing, especially in a position that you're in. You get to sit and talk with people as you're being creative and as you're offering a service, but you also then. Um, get to give them an opportunity to be heard and be seen in, in a very special way, which, you know, I used to bartend and, you know, it was difficult for me as a bartender because what I really wanted to do is be the stereotypical bartender where I just sit around and talk to people all day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but to actually make a living, I had to, you know, sling a lot of drinks and you don't really get to talk to people as much. Sure. And um, you know, part of the reason why I'm doing this, I mean, part of the reason why we're talking is because I would like to just sit around and talk to people all day. Yeah, so it's like, great. I better have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, amazing. You know, and that's, you know, you kind of have a, a podcast every day, you know, in a very intimate, you know, setting. It's not being recorded perhaps, but, you know, that's that's kind of what this is, except every single day, with uh with some of the same community a revolving community and you know people get added you know i'm sure on a regular basis and then as you apprentice new people uh that must be you know in increasing I mean, and well tell me if you see it this way but when you apprentice someone even if they go on someplace else you must feel in my mind you must feel like your your reach is expanding through this new person that you've you know you've touched their life yeah oh a hundred percent because uh if they make it through my apprenticeship and they then decide to leave uh i've given them a set of skills that they will always have yeah so they can't deny not going not this part of their life you know i always say what is your story going to be in 10 years from now in five years 10 years 15 20 years what is your story going to be you are building your story right now yep. and every day every moment that you are here on this earth your story is being built so you know this moment that you're with me for this one year of your of your apprenticeship it is so minuscule in comparison to the longevity of your career that you are about to embark on. Mm -hmm. So in this time, really enjoy it, grasp as much information, as much knowledge, use me as your learning vessel because you know I'm giving you something that not a lot of people will give, especially freely, you yeah. know? And I'm giving this to you. And um, 
you know, use this use this as as a time to really, you know, in, enjoy this moment and um, and add it to your story because in five years from now your story will be different. In ten years yeah. it will be different. But you'll you know? be, you're, I mean, you're creating um, or solidifying their foundation. I mean, maybe they have some 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 sort of foundation that they've acquired from you know some cosmetology or, or some sort of program yeah. but you know whatever they've learned they've learned perhaps you know they've got they've got all the tools and now you solidify their foundation you know for them to become you know a, an expert or, or a you know a high level uh provider yeah most definitely and every time that i take somebody on and train them i become better oh i'm sure yeah, I become well, better. I, they say I the uh, the best students are are teachers. So I mean, you know, to yeah. a certain extent, if you want to master something, you have to teach it. Oh, a hundred percent. And I'm never beyond saying, "Oh, I've been well, I've been doing hair for over forty years," and so I'm not about to say, "Oh, you know, I've been doing hair for so long." You know, I know everything there is to know about hair. I'm, I'm I'm good. You know, oh my gosh, it, it's it's. Our profession, our industry is evolving every day. There's always new techniques. There's always something new to learn. There's stuff out there that I don't even know how to do. I'm just like, oh, teach me that, you know? Oh, and cool. <laughs> wow, I love what you're doing. That's amazing. Can you teach me how to do that? And I'm not too proud to ever ask somebody, hey, I, I love that technique. Can I show me how you did that? So after you know? decades, of, yes, of doing what you're doing, how yeah. do you maintain that beginner's mind, that that openness, that childlike curiosity to to look for new things, to learn, and to be open to learning things from people that maybe you wouldn't have expected it? Like, how do you maintain that that openness, that that um, that curiosity? Okay, so one of the things that I do uh, every year is I pick a thing to do and I do it for that year at nauseam and it's outside of my hairdressing profession like give me so, give me an example so last year I did classical guitar oh wow okay That's and a, very much of a departure than I would think yeah, yeah and um I've done I went to the Epicurean Culinary, Culinary Institute and learned French cuisine for a year oh wow I did Portuguese for a I, year oh okay also continued it um, uh, um, learned to sing from the lead lead coach from uh, uh, Le Miserable. Ah, um, so I can I, I can I can hold it. I can hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> if you awesome. like me to give you something, I'm more than welcome. I'm more than happy to do that for you. I mean, um, I, I've been sung to on the show before, <laughs> so uh, I, you're welcome to. I'm <laughs> I'm over here a couple bars. <laughs> you might want to cut that part out though. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah. And so I, I decided I wanted to run a marathon every month for a year. Every month? Every month for a year. But you were, marathon. you were already, I, I know other people have done this, but, uh, without being fit, but you were already fit and, and, and maybe not trained for a marathon, but you already had a, a level of fitness when you decided to take that on. Yes. Yes, for sure. But I only managed to go to April on that on that challenge. I did January, February, March, and April, that's and then after amazing. after that's four marathons. And after April, my body was like, um, "Yeah, we're not going to do that anymore." <laughs> I get that. Yeah, we we might want to pick something else to continue out the year. Because <laughs> I mean, if. If you had nothing else to do in your life, perhaps it, you could have kept going more easily. But I imagine if you're running a business, you know, and you have to be on your feet and you're working with people and you're training people, that's yeah. a whole nother level. You know, uh, do you know, you know who Eddie Izzard is? Yeah, of course. Um, I love him. He's so amazing. Oh, me too. Um, but uh Eddie decided at one point in time, I think this maybe was a couple years ago that he was just going to run a marathon, like, you know, every week or something like that. And oh, wow. he, he basically started running and, um, I don't remember the, the entire story. I don't remember how long he did it for, but he, he ran like, 
like across several countries. Um, and I, I don't know if most of them were even had anything to do with um, actual competitions. Yeah. And he talked about like skin peeling off his feet and, and he really became conditioned through doing it and just brutalized himself. But, you know, the other side of that is, is, you know, he, he's a multimillionaire, you know, and the, my understanding of, because of his learning disabilities, the way he writes his, his, his jokes and his sets, it's mostly in his head and kind of goes over and goes over it. So, and running can be such a meditation as, as you know, so I would imagine he's able to do his job while he's running yeah. to a certain extent. And then he's got, you know, people to take care of them and drive him places and, and everything else. So that's like a whole nother level of thing, but just the fact that you made it past two, the past, the fact that you made one of them. I I have to to tell you though, I have to tell you, um, my marathon running days started way before that. So in 1991, um, when I was working for a local salon owner here in Manhattan Beach, he was a marathon runner. He's mm-hmm. since passed away, but he was a marathon runner. And one day he was talking to one of his clients and the LA Marathon was coming up that weekend. Nice. And he was like, oh yeah, the marathon, this, that, and the other. Oh yeah, it's so hard. And his client was like, oh yeah, oh my God. Blah, blah. And cocky me, <laughs> running a marathon, what is it? 20 something miles a day, it's 26.2. I so said, that's easy. I said, you guys, I, don't know what, I don't know what you guys did. Oh my God. I said, anybody could run a marathon. And they're like, Anthony. And I said, like, what? 26.2 miles? That's not a problem. And so they were like, I guarantee you cannot do that. It's without training. I hadn't trained at all. Wow. So that was probably like the Tuesday, Wednesday. That weekend, I went down to the, the Staples Center, registered to run it, or downtown LA Convention yep. Center, registered to run it. And that Sunday, I ran the marathon. Not a day of training, not one single day of training. And I did it in five and a half hours. That's actually a good time. That's a good time. You did it in five and a half hours. And then after I was done with that and I got and I recovered from the pain because I was hurting for a long time, I decided that I was going to train and run the New York City Marathon. Wow. And then I went and did that. And I did that in three hours and 33 minutes. And then I got back from that and I decided I was going to run Long Beach. And I did Long Beach uh, in February the following year. That was in November, the uh, um, New York. Then February the, the next year, I did the Long Beach and I did it in 309.50, which qualified me for Boston. So, and it just kept going on and on and on. So my times are getting faster and faster and faster. And my boss was like, oh my God. Actually, when he came to my house the morning after I did the marathon, which was the Monday, he came to pick me up to take me to lunch. And I had on these, um, these Timberland boots. I'll never mm. forget it. And I had them laced up so tight because the actual boot was holding my ankles and my feet together because I could barely walk. Yeah, so, so you, you, you had like a splint uh, oh, effect. It was like yeah. a splint that was holding me up. Boy. And uh, he was just like, I cannot believe you went and you are insane. And so I said, well, if I can do that in five and a half hours, I wonder what I could do if I trained and really put my mind to it. Yeah. So 3.33 was, and then 3.09, yeah. I got so many questions. <laughs> um, I mean- well, okay. Just, just to address the fact that you did that before getting into anything else, um, yeah. you have to have, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of feel like it's one thing I will say, mentally speaking, anyone can run a marathon if they put their mind to it and everyone and anyone who really wants to do it, they may have consequences. They may have blisters or bloodiness or whatever, but I would be willing to say just about anyone can do a marathon doing it in five hours for the first time. That's another level, um, (laughs) getting better and better. That makes that now makes me think that you have a natural gift of athleticism and, you know, because 
I had a, a good friend of mine. She was an ultra marathon runner. And I remember going with her to one of her competitions. She ran, uh, I think it was over 50 miles or something like that. And it threw, um, um, it was the, in the shadows of giants ultra marathon. So this was like just outside of Yosemite or, or partially in Yosemite. So it's kind of up and down trail running. And yeah. she came in fourth, uh, overall and number one for women by like an hour or something like that. It was like, she had some ridiculous time and in talking to her about her running, because running to her was like the ultimate meditation. Um, she talked about learning how to improve your gait and your step and your foot placement and, and all of that other stuff. So to some degree in my head, I'm thinking, you must just naturally have like a phenomenal instinct or, or kinesthetic awareness. Um, so is that part, do you think you have that? And then how much, you know, train, when you started to train and you started to take it seriously, did you have a running coach? Like what was, how did you master your body to find out what you were capable of, of doing in, in those, in just in those few marathons? Well, going before that, uh, in high school, I ran track. Okay. And I, so there and was I also some ran, history there. And I also ran cross country in, 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 in England as well. So I was a cross country runner and I was a track and field. So I did. So, you know, that kind of gave me some training for running. Yeah. So you, you must have had some really good coaches that gave you oh. a, a basis to build on. That's 100%, amazing. Okay. hundred percent. And then when I started training here, I didn't have a coach here, but what I would do was I would go down to the strand because I lived in uh, Manhattan beach at the time. Right. I, I live in West Hollywood now. So I would run down to the strand and very much like what I did with all of my marathons is I would just start to pace people right. and I would see someone in the distance and I would catch up to them. And I'd pace them for a little while, then see somebody else and go and hang with them and even start a conversation and say, hey, how you doing? They're like, hey, great. I said, oh my God, you keep it. such a great pace. You mind if I hang with you for a minute? They're like, sure. And either they would go off and leave me or I would go off and leave them, but I would always you know, use somebody to pace myself. So that's kind of how I did a lot of my training. And- um, Can, can I, I ask, this is a little bit of an esoteric question. Yeah. In the moments where you're pacing people, whether, you're doing it from a little bit of a distance so that they don't necessarily know you're there or yes. whether you're actually right side by side and you're having a conversation. Do you get a sense of like where your body and their body, like you're like, again, a little bit of an esoteric question, but do you get a sense like your body is learning from theirs or even vice versa? And, and like, you're kind of learning that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. Very much so. Because when you do that, you take on their stride Yeah. and you just, you, 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 it's all, it's like you morph into that person mm -hmm. um, whilst you're with them because um, especially, and then if you, if you're not, then my pace would go beyond that and I would just keep going. Yep. But if they keep in a really good pace, I'm like, wow okay i'm gonna try and hang at this pace so let me do what they're doing okay they're taking they're taking longer strides mm -hmm. and they're not doing a short stride here there and i'm gonna try and match that so yeah so it's almost like um metronome you know that tick yeah. tick yep. tick tick it would almost be like that where you kind of like get on their, their tick tock and you just keep going at their pace that's cool that's really cool. I, you know, there's something to be said. I used to, um, I, growing up, I did martial arts from a very young, very young age. And, mm -hmm. and then I got into, um, break dancing in, you know, in the eighties, uh, when I was a kid and then in college, I got into like modern dance and improv and, and other forms. And I then started teaching dance. And, um, so kind of the kind of, and I'm also an athlete of other, uh, you know, other sports as well. Yeah. Um, but there's something from in my experience and um, which, you know, which is the reason why I asked where, you know, <clears throat> matching someone else's body, feeling their body, even from a distance, 
um, and taking that in, it's kind of like empathy. It's kind of like, you know, when you see someone, you can just know they're sad or know they're happy it, sure. and you can kind of, and that kind of can change your mood. It's the same thing, except it's, it's musculature or, or athleticism or, or what have you. And, um, I, I, I think it's something that I don't hear talked about much, if at all, but I feel yeah. like it's so crucial to um to really developing in whatever physical capacity whether it's artistic or or just strictly um physical athletic you know and it's funny my only real regret um is i was i because of martial arts i could i could kick a football like a, as a punter i could kick a football like 60 yards at 14 years old and my high school coach played professional football, American football, and he was a punter and he had a Super Bowl ring. Like, that's a big deal. And I was too young to really understand what that meant. And no one explained it to me. He tried to get me to continue playing, you know, the rest of my high school career because he's like, just all you have to do is punch, just come on the field, you know, every now and again, you can train, you know, we'll get you kicking. And um, he, I don't think he never said you could get a scholarship, which may or may not have impacted me. He never said you could get, you know, you might get paid six figures to go and play for the NFL. If you continue at this level, like, or if he did, it just didn't reach me. And looking right. back, having an opportunity to have trained with a, an elite punter kicker um, to be, because I had a natural talent for it. Like it's the only real regret I have because that was an opportunity that I understand now, but it was never conveyed to me and I was never able to see it when yeah. at that age. Um, and, and so when, you know, did, when did you, when did you realize that you had that, that was an opportunity that you had, that you regretted? Like what, what, what part, what part of your life led you to that, to that I, that, that that's moment. a good question yeah. and i've never really thought about it no one's ever asked me um i would guess um i don't remember one specific moment in time where yeah. i was like oh shit i should have done that <laughs> um but i i think i was in my early 20s i think it, mm -hmm. it was maybe shortly after i moved out to los angeles because i came out here to be an actor and i've been performing my entire life you know oh, wow. the the thrill and the the aliveness the the um uh, the lucidity on stage performing um you know from a very early age was everything to me like mm -hmm. because i was able to feel the audience and i was able to have a conversation with the audience while performing my lines or while you know interacting with the folks on stage and it was like i was bilocated and two I was I was in the audience having a conversation energetically with them and I was in my body on stage doing what I was supposed to be doing and it was a magical conversation and and I remember in sixth grade um you know one of my kind of you know m real moments of clarity um is everywhere I walked every eye was on me every word I spoke they were tuned in and I could just feel, and I just knew this, this thing was happening. And I was like, this is magic. This is like what you see in star Wars, the force, or, you know, um, uh, whatever, whatever, you know, fantasy movies that I was watching and books that I was reading, like, this is magic. This is what it is. This is, this is everything. And, um, when I got to LA, and I was pursuing, you know, acting. Uh, this was early. This was 2000. I got here in September 2000. Uh, reality TV had just started a year or two prior. Um, celebrity and personality started becoming more and more important. And I, and somewhere in the first couple of years of being here, I realized that man, if I was a pro football player or a pro athlete or an Olympic athlete or a a uh, celebrity musician or anything that had some level of whatever, 
I would have opportunities that I am fighting to get and I'm not getting, you know, and for five years I fought for auditions and I didn't 99% of the time I couldn't even get in the room to read. And it was so frustrating. And it was somewhere in that time that I, I, I was like, man, I really wish I would have become an expert in something that had a, a little bit straighter path. Yeah. And, um, and it was around that time that I realized that I probably could have played professional football as a punter. Like okay. I, I wouldn't be, I'm five ten, you know, on a, on a good day. Uh, you know, like I, I I'm right now, I'm probably like one seventy six eight when somewhere right in there, like yeah. at my biggest, when I was lifting weights, I might've been, you know, 215, 220 when I was really pumping iron, but that's tiny for, you know, most football players. Yeah. And, um, so I, I probably wouldn't have done anything else, but they pay, they pay a lot of money. It's, it's an important strategic position. I never knew. It never occurred to me. If yeah. you're not the quarterback or you're not the running back or the linebacker, like, you know, the wide receiver, if, you know, those are the glamour spots. So it, just, it was like, ah, whatever. Yeah. I just didn't yeah. know. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So long diatribe about me. Sorry no, about no, that. No, um, no, no, thanks for that. But yeah, I mean, it's you so you were a runner and you actually got some great training did you ever think about competing because you you left school so you didn't go to college you didn't go to uni uh mm -hmm. you didn't um you obviously didn't pursue you know olympics or anything like that was there no. any part of you that thought or were you ever told that you had a natural talent that you could have been like a, a gotten a scholarship or or anything like that no no i just knew that i loved sports when i was in england too i played squash i played um semi-pro squash oh wow yeah and so i was with different leagues around the uk and so squash was my thing and when i came here in 1989 uh nobody played squash <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> where do you go to get a good game of squash nobody plays squash yeah so i had to kind of like pivot out of that but um uh, my first, my first break where I actually thought I might want to go into um, some type of sports, but doing it commercially was when I auditioned for a Reebok um, step aerobics workout video cool. called Power Step 2 with okay. uh, Jim Miller, the originator. And I went down to the auditions. One of my uh, friends told me about it. I was already doing step, uh, step aerobics at the gym almost every day. And they were like, why don't you go and audition for this open call they're having for Reebok? It's downtown LA and it's, they're, they're looking for people to be in their next new video and whatever. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went down, auditioned for it. And several auditions later, I got the part. That's awesome. And, um, yeah. and um, That's a big deal. I mean, because there's thousands of people, I'm sure, that auditioned for that. Yeah. And there's me, you know, I'm a hairstylist. And, you know, they're like, well, you know, what, what, what gym or what, what kind of, what, how are you connected to the fitness industry? I said, well, I'm actually not. I cut hair. <laughs> yeah. for I cut their hair. I cut for, you know, athletes' hair. So. <laughs> I, yeah. But I think the reason why they chose me was because um, I was in really good shape. And yeah. I had long hair at the time as well. And they just liked my whole look. Nice. You know, it was, very, it was very exotic, they called it. Yeah. So, yeah. My look and, um, and I got the, and then that kind of made me think, oh, you know, maybe I should do more fitness commercials or fitness videos or that kind of stuff. Um, but I never did. So it just kind of, you know. You, you I, got, you I, got your fill. I, I mean, I never really pursued it. Yeah. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that's, it seems to be a, a running theme in your life where you take something on to see, you know, what you can do, how far you can take it. And then you're like, okay, like, you know, you don't, you're done. You, you got what you needed, which I yeah. think is great. Yeah, definitely. Like as, as, a, as a, for instance, um, so for the month of, for the past 28 days, I started a fitness challenge. So I, on my Facebook page, every morning, I post a video, it's a 30 minute video, and it's a 30 minute workout video. 
and it's 30 days for 30 minutes. And so two more days, the whole thing is going to be over. But um, it's been incredible. So I've been having a lot of people log on, doing my workouts every morning. That's you know, no sugar, no alcohol for this period as well. Yep. And um, yeah, so for the last 30 days, we've been doing this work. And I just wanted to do this because, especially for my girls that I have working for me here, they don't work out. They eat lots of sugary foods. And they was American diet. That, yes, they always complain about being tired. Oh my God, I had such a hard time getting out of bed this morning. Oh, I'm so tired. This, that. I'm like, right, okay. So I started this thing and it wasn't aimed at them, but it was, you know, yeah, to of course. Also get them involved as well as a lot of, a lot of um, my friends and family members and different people, you know, from everywhere. So it's, it's been really good. It's been really good. It's really fun. The workouts are challenging, but um, no weights included. It's just all, you know, using your body weight, you know, squats, sit-ups, push-ups, you know, that kind of thing, you know, jumping jacks, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that kind of gets back into that kind of esoteric question I asked earlier about, you know, being aware of, you know, how following someone or falling in sync with someone kind of can change you. I mean, here you are now, obviously a super athletic person. Um, you're offering to be that person that they can fall in sync with so that they can you know, get in their own groove and find their own path. I mean, that's, that's really amazing. Yeah. I, I just, I just love it. Just, it just fuels me, makes me happy, you know, especially when I get people reaching out and direct messaging me or texting me and saying that they're loving the workouts and they really awesome. feel and see a difference. And, you know, it's, 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 it's so great. So, yeah. So do you yeah. now, as far as going through life, I mean, you talked about how, you know, growing up, you didn't have a lot of money and, and, um, and then I'm sure because I've started businesses and, and, uh, it's tough, you know, life in general can be tough. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. Like, even if you take the most mundane path, uh, it's still going to be filled with, you know, brambles and, and, uh, bumps, bruises and trips and falls and everything else. Um, so how do you deal with all that? Or like, what are your coping mechanisms? Like, obviously athleticism is, is, is one creativity seems to be another, but how, how do you manifest or, or develop or, or how did you find the coping mechanisms that work for you? Um, especially at an early age, because you were, you were so kind of conscious and aware of your path, uh, mm -hmm. at an early age, like, how were you dealing with, the negativity or the the distresses stresses or detractors in your life yeah i i always say um if you don't know where you're going you'll never get there so you know put something in the gps anything put just put an address there yeah and just head that way and, you know, along the way, you know, the GPS will take you down a cul-de-sac, it'll take you down a rough little road here. And, but, but if you keep that address locked in, you will eventually get there. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and that's something that I've always kind of held true. You know, I've always had a vision of, you know, what I want and where I want to go in my life. And I set my goals high and, you know, I just keep heading towards that goal, yeah. you know, and, and every obstacle that I come across, I always say, this is meant to happen. And it's part of my journey and it's part of my story. It's and part of what you need to learn to, to continue. Exactly. Exactly. And I look at things like, well, this is, this sucks, but um, the answer isn't clear right now, but I'm sure it will be. So, we're going to get through this as best we can. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I've always looked, looked at, looked at life. Do you have, um, I mean, to some extent, it sounds like self-talk. So you're talking to yourself and you're, you're kind of, uh, zeroing in on, on, or reminding yourself of that goal. Do you have any specific practice that goes along with that? Like, you know, like a meditation or mindfulness or drawing or, or, um, any, any, anything that kind of gets you because, you know, you have that emotion, you have that experience. Someone says something and you're set off. Now, 
theoretically, if 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 you just let it go, it's going to be gone in a minute. Mm-hmm. But if for some reason or another, it's a bigger obstacle than something you can just let go and you've got to deal with it, then what do you use or how do you like, do you just get quiet? Like, what is it that, you know, that allows you to remind yourself of that goal and that address of where you're going? Yeah. I, you know, I, when in, in times of my life, for instance, when a, when a client comes in, if there's, Sometimes you know when someone's just not happy from the moment they walk in. Right, you, just, sure. you just know they they had they they've got whatever it is going on in their life and they just and and here they are, you know, and they use you as you know the whipping post, you know. And um I I never get I never get angry or emotional about um situations. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I had a client that I only did her hair twice. And the first time I did her hair, um, every time I would take a section and cut, she would go, okay, hold on. Okay, hold on. Okay, go ahead. And wow. I would take it and I would cut again. And she would go, oh, wait, wait a second, wait. Now she had been going to Vida Sassoon in LA and New York. She was very high profile. She was, you know, all that. And she, I just don't think she trusted me, even though, and at the time I had just won the show, She a Genius. Yeah, and, yeah. and she, you know, that's why she came to me because I was a season one winner and she wanted somebody exceptional. But there was that level of trust that wasn't there still. And so I said to her, okay, so I get it that you want to keep checking your hair because you want to make sure that it's good. I'm going to allow you to do that after I'm done with the entire cut because every time you put your hands through your hair, you 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 kind of mess up my sections and I don't know where I'm at. I need to resection everything. So can you just not do that? So we got to the end of the haircut and she did it several more times after that. She came back again. The same thing happened. Actually smacked on the wrist with the comb. I said, you're doing it again, stop. <laughs> she left. And then that night I called her up and I said, you know, I was in, in my office and I was like, okay, so I could go through this again or I can deal with this. And, you know, as an artist, as somebody that um, has been in this industry for a very long time, I don't need to have somebody make me feel bad about my profession and what I'm doing and, you know, all that. Even if you don't have been doing it for a year, like that's ridiculous because it's just a lack of respect. If you don't want to be here, don't be here. If you don't trust me, leave. Exactly. And if it's a bad haircut, don't come back and don't tip me. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. exactly. So she picks up the phone after I called her, and I said, "Hey, I said this is Anthony calling, and you know, do you have a minute?" And she goes, "Yeah, yeah, totally. What's what's going on?" And I said, "Well, you know, I got thinking about you know um, your haircut today. You know, you were in, and, um, and I really think that it would be." best if you found somebody to go to that you trusted because it doesn't seem to me that you trust what I'm doing and she goes oh my goodness Anthony I can't believe really and I said yeah because you still check my work you still you know put me through all of this angst when you come in with your haircut and she goes I love my hair you do an amazing job on this okay be that as it may I really do feel that it's better if you go to somebody else to get your haircut because I can't do your hair anymore because I feel terrible after you leave that last two times are just about terrible and you know I don't want to do that to myself anymore life's too short and she and she was I can't believe this I am I don't know why this is ridiculous I love I love the work that you do and I I, you know and I'm so sorry you know is the end and I said yeah I said well I said you know we're good I said you know good luck good you know if you need a recommendation I'm happy to find one for you you know somebody of your ill somebody that you like But um, I, I just can't do this. And she goes, I, well, I, and so I, I handled that in a very professional, polite way, you know, whereas, you know, I could have just been, you know, whatever on the phone, but that's kind of, I go there first. Well, you, you know? could have also just said, you know, whether she was calling you to book or, or someone else in your office to book, you could have just said, don't ever book. I'm never available for this person again. I mean, because I'm sure <laughs> other people do that where like oh, for this person, I have, I, I have never, ever, ever have an available slot. You know what I mean? You could have done that. I mean, and yes. so, 
by by facing it in my mind by facing it you are you know you're giving her an opportunity to see you and see herself more importantly correct because you know hopefully she'll respect you for it and then hopefully again and this is in my mind she's going to be able to see herself and grow from it and and not do it to someone else well <laughs> probably it's not the first time that's happened i'm, I'm guessing yeah probably not <laughs> so, yeah so yeah so uh i i tend to err on the side of grace um in situations you know yeah i mean it's a it's a strange thing you know i've I've been playing with ideas around service and being of service. And um, I've written a ton of blogs or materials or essays, and I don't really post them. I'm going to post them. I just haven't felt ready to post them for whatever reason. Um, it's just kind of all part of what I want to do with foundational steps. And, and, you know, eventually I'm going to post them and do like little videos, like little one minute or 30 minute or uh, 30 second kind of like intros to like, okay, I've written this thing. This is what it's about. Here's the basic, you know, you don't have to read it if you're listening to this, because here's the, you know, main points. Um, but it's there if you're more into reading, you know, like I'm thinking I'm going to do something along those lines. And, you know, one of the things that I put down as a note for being of service is to, you know, to truly be of service. It's not just about giving. It's also about restricting and, and putting parameters on things because you can't really truly be of service to someone if you're like, let's say I'm, I'm a rock climber. So if I take someone climbing and I'm trying to do them a service to teach them and guide them, if I don't put parameters and restrictions and, 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 you know, have some, some real strict rigor in there, they could kill themselves and they could also kill me. So, you know, to truly be of service, it, it just as much as you have to be compassionate and, and giving, um, there is a need for, you know, strict rigor, discipline, and, and, um, you know, the, the opposite of what some people might think of, of being of service, because, you know, you're creating boundaries. And, you know, I think, I think, you know, confronting someone like that is not only professional, but it also is a, is a greater service than just cutting their hair because you're treating them as, as an equal, you know, because that's how you would, I'm assuming that's how you'd want to be treated. You want someone to tell you if, you know, you were doing something that was getting in the way of someone being great. Like if you, if you hired someone to, uh, you know, interior design or, or, uh, lay tile or, you know, whatever, like, you know, you don't want to get in their way. They're the expert, let them do what they do. Exactly. And if you're not happy, then afterwards say, I thought the grout would be gray instead of black. I don't know, whatever. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's I, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, and it's, it, it is, it, it, by calling it out, you're, you know, they, they are also learning, you know, like, wow. Because if somebody did that to me, I would, I would certainly go, oh my goodness, let me look at that. Wow, was I? what to get fired by your hairstylist you have to be pretty bad <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay look at it like that so if she was telling a friend oh my hair just called me and told me not to come back it's like okay what did you do you know yeah. it, it would because like, no hairdresser ever does that what did you do yeah. you know so um that's that's a wake-up call when your hair yeah that's a big hairstylist moment. says i don't want your business then you know then you know you're 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 not you're, i mean that's <laughs> the when you hear about or you see the signs, you know, we, we, we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone at any time for, for, you know, whatever reason, uh, mm -hmm. or no reason. Um, to me, that's what that's about. Like if you disrespect, if I had, uh, if I had an eatery or if I had any kind of business where people could come there, if I tell you to leave, it's because you're disrespecting my business. And, and depending on, 
the situation, you know, obviously you don't want to ask, you don't want to escalate things. You don't want to allow things to get to a, a physical confrontation if you can all avoid it. But so, you know, the, you may have to temper, you know, not say what you want to say, but it's also important to maintain those boundaries because you can't give good service to them or anyone else around you if you're not able to do your best. And if you feel horrible after giving a haircut uh, and styling someone's hair, then how, how much time do you then need to be able to take care of the next person? Because they have just, you know, ruined your, not necessarily ruined your day, but they've, they've put a roadblock, which is impeding your ability to do your business to, to the best of your ability. Yeah. They've, they've, they've changed your energy. Yeah, you know, your your energy, your energy, your energy is a little bit different after that type of experience, and it takes a while back, takes a, a while to get centered again. You know, yeah. so so that's 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 what that does. It just messes up your flow, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unfortunate on one hand, but on the other hand, it's kind of a it's another weird little blessing because you have an opportunity to you know, hopefully nudge someone in, in a direction that's going to make them a better person. Yeah. You would hope. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, and that's really all you can do. Like, I, I mean, I've worked, I worked, I've done a lot of work with kids over the years and mm -hmm. worked, you know, whether business management or, or consulting or whatever, when I work with people uh, or even in my friends, you know, I try to always maintain a level of service to the people that I'm surrounded with, um, whether it's professional or friendship or otherwise, because I'm always working to be a better person. I may not always be doing, you know, at my best, you know, because I'm trying to figure it out, you know, and sure. depending on if I'm learning something new or whatever, but I'm always mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to be better. And I want that for my friends. I want that for my friends. You know, I want that from, from my, my uh, coworkers or, or colleagues, you know, it's like, that's, I mean, you know, it's like what we talked about earlier. It's like, if you're the best individual you can be, then you can be a better member of the community and the community will get more from you and you'll get more from them. If, if you, you know, rise up like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm curious, you know, you've, You've been doing all this for a long time. You you're geared towards being of service and and kind of outreach and community and everything else. Do you have anything else going on right now in your life outside of of the salon that you're working on or any new projects that you're because you you've had this amazing life where you just kind of tackle things and you just go at things like you have no it seems like you just have you've mentally removed all of the things from your life that may stop you. And it's now just, a, it's a, a matter of figuring out how to do something instead of yeah. can, can I do that? Of course I can do it. I just need to learn how. So exactly. what are you working on now? Um, like what new things, new ventures, you know, what's going on? All right. So I need to get back on TV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, okay. Well, let, let's let's take a minute because some people are gonna say that's awfully vain. Um, but I don't see it that way. I, um, so I'm curious how you see it. Why why do you need to get back on TV? Or what's what's on TV? What do you get out of TV? Or what can you give through being on TV? I I you know I would love to do a. Uh, a makeover show, you know, makeover shows were really popular. I did um, 10 Years Younger on TLC. I did 60 episodes of that um, with Kyan Douglas from Queer Eye. He was the host. I was one of the um, experts um, in the team. And um, that was a great show. And since those shows have pretty much gone off the air, there's been nothing except for Queer Eye right now. Yeah. And um, I would like to develop a show that is all encompassing mind, body, soul, um, you know, uh, the way you uh, present yourself to the world and to yourself, you know, um, fitness, fashion, the whole nine yards. So what I'm going to start doing as of, uh, well, it's supposed to be next month, but maybe July, beginning of July, I'm going to start a, a men's, um, men's grooming thing. So nice. it's going to be about men's 
hair, men's beards, men's skin, uh, fashion, what type of underwear to wear, what type of jeans to wear, you know, um, all that kind of stuff, products and, and the whole thing, colognes, product, and it's gonna be all about men. So that's my next, that's my next venture that. So I'm waiting until my 30 days, 30 minutes is over, which ends in two days. I'm heading off to Portugal, getting back from there, gonna be busy for the, pretty much the whole month of uh, May. June is my birthday month, then July, we start with our men's grooming. And um, so I wanna do that. And then hopefully I'll have enough to pitch at some point. So, so you're uh, gonna record most or all of that? Oh yeah, oh okay. yeah, 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 yeah. And, and do you have, friend, you have everything, you have like a camera crew or, or a, at yeah. least a camera person? Yeah, so, oh, yeah. Wow. my friend, so my friend Steve, um, is, he's at Coachella right now, but he, um, I met him, uh, he's a cameraman on TLC. Okay. And we've been friends for many, many years since I did the show. And yeah, he's, he's on board to film every episode of that with me. Wow. So yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, so now it's procuring the, the, the models, um, you know, the guys for the skin, beers, maybe we could use you. Uh <laughs> I'd be happy. I'd be happy to, if I can be of service, I'd be happy to do it. I mean, I, I've never been, it's funny because I, when I was in, uh, when I was in high school, I did some modeling and I did, I had better hair back then. It's a little bit thinning now. Um, but um, I, I did hair modeling and, and all of that stuff, but I've never really cared that much about fashion or hair. I'm just kind of like, ah, here I am, <laughs> like, you know, whatever, because yeah. To me, as an actor, it's like, I just want to glide into or fit into. And so I've always been focused on my internal journey well, and being a good looking person has actually gotten in my way because I've, I've wanted to play character roles. In the first five years, one of the biggest problems I had was I was going into auditions thinking I was a character actor because I had training and I had experience and I'd done all the stage work. And they're like, no, no, we just want you for this. Yeah, yeah. We don't care about this breathing or how you're walking or or this this emotional thing. We don't care about any of that. Just, yeah, yeah, just yeah, say yeah, the yeah. words are like, yeah, okay. You're like, oh God. <laughs> you're like, okay. <laughs> but I've I've embraced um I've embraced I under I understand. I've finally made peace with the way I look uh, over the last few years really yes. I'm 40 45 almost 46 and i've only You're recently in the last five <laughs> years feel like i've made peace with you know the way i look and 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 everything um but yeah i mean i would love to be a part of you know that if that's something that yeah i could actually if it works for you and yeah definitely yeah, yeah i would i would definitely sure learn a lot <laughs> yeah you know one of the things i always say you know even when i interview here at the salon right I always have this one thing that I always keep in my mind. You never have a second opportunity to make a first impression. So when that employee walks through the door, that's, I see you for who you are. Yeah. That's, you came to an interview to my salon and that's, you prepared for this interview, I'm going to assume, and that's what you're giving me. So I, 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 I go by that because the second time I meet you, you could, that could all be changed, but I'm oh, remembering yeah. the first time, yep. you know, the first time I met you, that's my impression. So, um, you know, based, based on that, you know, for different situations, I feel, you know, um, us guys, we need to approach different situations differently, you yep. know, and go into each situation with a different mindset or you know and we need to focus on the outside a little bit you know we do and it's one of those things that like i've learned like i i mean i strutted my stuff when i was younger but i did it out mm. of out of a, a sense like i have to or i'm supposed to people expect yeah. this of me mm -hmm. um and i think that that's a very common thing um for for men and women for yeah. for for people in general because we you know, we are kind of expected that if we fit certain things, then we're supposed to go in that box and, and fill that box out. And then, you know, now with a lot of the way the world is kind of evolving and opening up to 
uh, gender identity and, and sexual preference and this, that, and everything else, I think there's more boxes, but we're still being put in boxes and saying, this is how you're supposed to look. And so instead of saying, you know, which box do I want to fill out or which boxes do I want to fill out? Um, we just kind of blindly, you know, almost get, um, herded into a box and say, you know, people are treating you this way. So you're going to have to do this. You need to wear this and you need to do that. And I'm like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. And, and it's that, okay, fine. That gets us into trouble because that's the, that's not the joy. That's not the gratitude. That's not the love of life. That's the, I don't really want to, but I guess I have to, because you say, you know, I'm supposed to be this. So I guess I'm going to be this. Mm -hmm. It's like, as an actor, I get to choose whether I take a role or not. But as a human, um, oftentimes we're not told that we get to choose to accept the role that we're put into or not. And that's, I think, what it really comes down to. And it sounds like you're going to help people or help men in this new project to empower them, to give them the confidence to, to really step into the role that they want to play in their life yeah 100 100 percent um that's awesome it's, it's yeah i i i truly believe that and you know my dad used to say to me um if you go somewhere and you're the best dressed person in the room don't be embarrassed about that yeah and he, he always used to say that to me that's important and uh and that that to me has, has always held true so if i'm going somewhere i'll put on a suit i'll i'll, I'll get dressed up and my other half is like are you what are you doing and I'm like, I'm wearing, a, wearing a suit it's like this is no and I'm like yes <laughs> it's like I've got jeans on good for you I'm gonna wear a suit and I guarantee you when I go where I'm going people are like oh my god you look amazing wow you look great and he's standing there going yeah he does look good doesn't he <laughs> like, you should put a suit on too so it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things yeah. you know so um you know uh you just got to feel confident in yourself and um you know not allow you know situations to determine what you should be you yeah. know and it's i mean all, uh, yeah yeah i think i think that's super important and there's there's um God, i can't think of uh a friend of I, I believe a friend of mine brought this up and i don't know where it came from maybe a famous author maybe just one of those anonymous things mm -hmm. but um there's something you know, when you step up and when you, you know, present yourself uh, in your power, whether that's through looks or intelligence or your expertise, you know, yeah. you are giving people permission to also step up and be their best. Yeah. And so, um, and I, I, I don't, I think it was my friend, Ben Whitehair, uh, who we were having this conversation and it's really about the permission, giving yourself the permission gives everyone else the permission to be their best. And that's kind right. of, you know, what you're talking about, I think. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah, exactly. exactly yeah. Right. That's an amazing, uh, that's a really amazing thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's a wonderful place to end. And we, you know, we could always do a round two uh, at some point in the future, but I feel like, you know, we've gotten some really great, um, it was, it was just a great conversation. Um, so I'm going to put your, your link, uh, your, your website, the Londoner, um, where is it? Is it just the Londoner, yeah. the, the Londoner salons.com. I'll put that in, uh, the show notes. I noticed that all of your social media is there. Is there any other links or anything else that where people can find you that, uh, um, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, Instagram, Anthony Morrison living, living, Anthony Morrison, living at living. Anthony Morrison living. Yeah. Okay. And that's on Instagram. And, um, and yeah, so I'm posting a lot of stuff on there to do with, you know, my main stuff and health and all that. So that's my whole, that's, it's all about living, living your best life and living, living with purpose. So that's, that's, that's going to be there. IG. Okay. I got that noted. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Don't forget to leave a comment or a review. I'd love to hear your thoughts. New episodes every Tuesday and check us out on YouTube for short clips from each episode.
Thank you. And until next time, remember your life story is yours to write and rewrite as many times as you want. Thank you.